Hi friends, I recently showed this cordless spray gun bought at a flea market. It is used but in working condition, only its nickel cadmium battery with a charger is outdated. So today we will redo it all. The spray gun is good from a well-known German brand. It's quite high quality but during operation hums very strongly, has a power switch and a fuse. There is a button at the back that can be pressed to adjust the angle of the spray. I got it along with a case and several attachments. The volume of the tank is half a liter, the flow rate is 300 milliliter per minute. Well, in general, the spray gun for me is a tool of secondary importance. Due to the presence of familiar cans in stores, having a separate spray gun isn't very important but nice. I love cordless tools and it will not be superfluous in the collection. So far I have only sprayed water with it. We will redo it and then test it with paint. First let's disassemble it to look what's inside. The spray gun consists of a pump that creates pressure in the tank and such a thing filled with compound. It's a smart electronic with a control driver. In fact the pump is an electromagnet, that is, there are no rotating parts. This is just a conventional electromagnet controlled by the previously shown block, which generates current pulses with adjustable amplitude. This part is a piston on which an electromagnet presses. The piston is made in a simple way. There is a return spring and a tube with two holes, inside which the piston moves. By making a reciprocating motion due to an electromagnet, the piston through the first hole injects pressure into the reservoir. Due to this, the paint rises through the tube to the second hole, from where the paint is sucked up and then sprayed. The old battery, as already said, is 18 volt nickel cadmium. The battery capacity is 1200 mAh per hour. Opening inside, we find 15 pieces. The nominal voltage of each cell is 1.2 volts. In principle, the battery is in good condition. Perhaps this spray gun was not used often, but in some places, traces of corrosion are still visible. Nickel cadmium batteries are no longer used by power tool manufacturers. Now everyone has switched to lithium. Cadmium batteries have a very serious drawback, the memory effect. Before each charging process, they must be completely discharged, otherwise the battery will degrade each time, but lithium is almost devoid of this parasitic effect. Another disadvantage of nickel cadmium can be called a lower specific energy capacity compared to lithium 50 to 60 watt hour per kilogram versus an average of 200 watt hour per kilogram for lithium. These values may vary depending on battery modifications. Also, the self discharge of lithium is much less than that of nickel. Of the advantages of nickel cadmium, you can indicate frost resistance. They work at temperatures up to 50 degrees Celsius below zero. Lithium is afraid of frost, with the exception of some modifications. Nickel cadmium is also not as critical to a deep discharge as lithium, and even they need to be stored in a discharge state in contrast to the same lithium. Of course, it's safer. By the way, a lot of service types of nickel cadmium batteries are literally eternal. I think everyone, if want, will find such an old battery from 60s or 80s, which works great to this day. Such batteries can be brought back to life with training cycles, even in the event of degradation due to improper use. This was a little off-topic, but now, about the new battery. The native battery, as already said, is 18 volt. Inside the spray gun we can see a smart gizmo filled with a compound that turns off the device if the battery is discharged below 15 volts. Therefore, to convert to lithium it is necessary to use at least 5 cans connected in series. As a result, the total voltage of the new battery will be higher than that of the original one, but this will not affect the work in any way, it has been checked. The battery case allows you to install 5 and more banks of 18650 type. So we will insert 10 and every two banks will be connected in parallel to increase the total capacity and current output. For me, the large capacity of the battery is not important since the device will be used for small painting works. The current consumed by the spray gun during operation doesn't exceed 4 to 4.5 amps, which means that if you want you can use ordinary, good batteries, but of course it is better to use high current ones. 
I have practically new cards for 1500 to 1600 milliamps hour from another device. They are high current. I wanted to put these beauties with a capacity of 3 amps hour and a current output of 30 amps, but they were quite expensive and I decided to save them for another project of mine, a rechargeable angle grinder. These are of dubious origin, but I have carried out a number of experiments and I am sure that they can easily withstand discharge currents of 15 amps for a long time. There are traces of post resistance welding on them. We carefully clean them with a drill, prepare the cans for a new welding. This time I will use a condenser welding and weld with a nickel tape of 0.2 mm thickness. The protection board will be like this, without a balancing system. Usually it is not good, but in general these simple boards are also not bad if they work with batteries, which are almost the same in internal resistance and capacity, and this is just our case. The finished battery looks like this, the cans are additionally fixed with a sealant. The capacity of the new battery is slightly more than that of the old one, 1600 versus 1200 mAh, and of course the weight of lithium is much less, it remains only to check the operation. The original charger is with transformer, bulky, heavy. I wouldn't be me if I didn't replace all this with a compact impulse charger, and this charger by tradition should be completely homemade. A few words about the charging itself. I already shot a separate video on this topic and I highly recommend watching it. The link will be in the description. This is a full-fledged charger with stabilization of current and voltage, that is, it will charge the lithium battery in the correct way. This means that battery charge up to the set voltage value that is set by you and the stable current which is also set by the user. Specifically, this option provides an output voltage somewhere from 16.5 to 23.5 to 24 volts and is suitable for charging 4S and 5S batteries with a stable current of up to 800 mA, also with the ability to adjust. Charging, as you noticed, is assembled on a factory board. At one time, I made a bunch of such chargers for a variety of purposes. It should be noted that there is an error with the connection of the optocoupler on the board that appears in the video. I redid the initial versions of the boards a long time ago, correcting all the shortcomings. In my opinion, boards turned out very nice. I tried to maintain the norms for the wiring of the boards of impulse sources. The distances were observed, there is milling at places with possibility of spark breakdown. Gerber files of new boards will be in the archive of the project. Also, you can download the folder with the name Gerber without unpacking and upload it to the website of our sponsor GLCPCB. Pay for the order and get universal charger boards for almost any screwdriver. They can easily be recalculated for a different voltage and current. Here I showed how this is done. The link to the website of the GLCPCB website, which will make for you boards of excellent quality of any complexity and size will be left in the description. The charger has a bunch of protections built into the microcircuit. The trimming resistors on the board are responsible for adjusting the current and voltage. It also has LED indications. It is built on just one TNY267-268 microchip, which is a complete microcircuit and on board has PWM controller, a power switch and everything else that is necessary for operation. The feature of this microcircuit, and in general of microcircuits from this line, is that it doesn't need an additional winding of the transformer to power it, only mains winding is enough. The power of the charger is limited by the type of microcircuit and the quality of its cooling. In our case, charging will work in a closed box and this must be taken into account.
The Dual Operational Amplifier LM358 is responsible for stabilizing the current and voltage, as the reference source used the famous TL431. The task of the OP amp is that it constantly compares the charging output voltage with the reference through the divider. If a difference appears, this affects the PWM through the feedback line on the optocoupler. The same is in the case of current, only this time the voltage drop from the current sensor is compared with the reference voltage. I already talked in detail how this works in the specified video. Let's show the mode of operation of the source, stabilization of current or voltage. During charging, the current stabilization indicator glows. As the battery is charging, the current decreases and the unit enters the voltage stabilization mode and another indicator glows. This charger is universal and can be used for almost any battery. The output current and voltage can be changed by recalculating the dividers in the feedback circuit. The circuit isn't afraid of short circuits and, as practice has shown, is quite reliable and also easy to maintain and repair. An important part is the power pulse transformer. On the diagram I signed in detail the characteristics of the core and the winding data specifically for this charger. Circuit is single cycle flyback. Although we call this a transformer, in fact it is a choke and a non-magnetic gap is needed between the halves of the core. It must be calculated based on the operating frequency, brand and type of core, output characteristics and so on. There are generally accepted rules about drilling up pulse transformers, such as the location of windings, but in the case of such tiny transformer, violation of these rules will not lead to serious consequences. I first reeled up the primary winding completely, then the secondary. We do it layer by layer. Each layer is isolated with one or two layers of Captain tape. Upon completion of the winding, we isolate the winding with five to six layers of tape. Then the secondary winding is reeled up. It is important to reel up the windings in the same direction. If the primary is reeled up clockwise, then secondary also clockwise. It is necessary to mark the beginning of the winding of both the primary and secondary windings and connect to the board correctly. On the board and on the diagram, the beginning of the windings are indicated by dots. The output diode can be without a radiator, although it is desirable. It will not heat up very much due to the small output current, but we must remember that we use closed case, where the cooling conditions are poor. I also recommend gluing a small heat sink on the PWM chip. An additional heat sink for it is a massive tint polygon on the board. Ready charger works fine. Charging time will depend on the capacity of the battery and the output current you set. To set up the charger, we turn on the unit to mains and connect a multimeter to its output. By rotating the first trimmer, we set the voltage of the end of the charge. In my case, we multiply 5 lithium cells by 4.2 volts per can and get 25 volts. Next, we connect the assembled battery in a discharge state. We connect an ammeter to the gap of one of the output wires. We rotate the current regulator and stop at the desired value of the charge current. After full adjustment, we glue the screws of the trimming resistors. It only remains to fit the case for charging and you are done. I decided to completely abandon the docking station and the original adapter. I made a charging connector on the battery itself, so it's more convenient for me. It remains only to fill in the paint and check the work. Of course, not everything is so simple. You need to vary with the viscosity and make control runs in order to achieve the golden mean. In general, these things phrase very well. I like the work. The outgo of paint is large. It would be worthwhile to make the tank larger, but on the other hand, this would increase the weight. After completing the work, you need to pour the solvent into the tank and turn on the device to clean the paint residues. Well, another instrument in my new collection has been given a new life. I don't know how often I will use it, but it will not be superfluous on the household. 
Also, the COVID isn't end up yet and this device can spray alcohol. But this is in case if all my other alcohol dispensers break at once. Yes, I'm paranoid. Any of my guests will get a shower of pure, undiluted medical alcohol, so you're welcome. This video comes to an end. You will find all the additional information in the description. Please don't forget to rate this video and share with your friends if you liked it. Now I say goodbye until we meet again. With you as always was Kasian TV.